We are here to talk about Esther. Uh, we are coming out of, of a series. Last week was Mother's Day. We did a Mother's Day uh, series or sermon. Uh, uh, yeah, Homily. Homily, a set of homilies, I guess, last week. Uh, before that, though, we were doing a few weeks in, in the book of Proverbs. And so we did Proverbs in money, we did Proverbs in government, and we did, uh, Shane did a, a collection of Proverbs with no particular one in mind, but he picked a few of them that he thought uh, would be beneficial for us and went through that. This week, we are starting a series in Esther. And Esther, generally, when you think of the book of Esther, um, you don't think of that as a sermon series a lot of times, at least not you know, like Genesis or the Gospels. Um, I, if you went out and you know looked at all the sermons that have been preached, you know there's probably a lot more on the Gospels and Genesis than there are Esther. Um, but Esther is an important book. You know you probably had Bible studies on Esther, or you know at least heard the story growing up in Sunday school. And so this week we are starting in the book of Esther. It is part of the Bible. It is God inspired, and uh, there's benefit to be had to be looking at it. And um, so we're going to do that. And it's a beautifully laid out book. Um, it's uh, as I started reading it more and more and looking at the historical context, uh, there's a lot going on at the time and a lot that happens in this book. And uh, it, it's interesting for a few different reasons that we'll get into in a little bit. But to start out, I can tell you that we're going to spend some time in history starting out. So if you like history, uh, you're going to like this first bit. Uh, if you don't like history, I've got some pictures and slides up here that hopefully will keep you interested. Although I think the history is really fascinating and um, I, I hope to, to make it come alive a little bit this morning because it really is important to understanding the context of Esther and where we're going in Esther. And so we're going to look at the historical context this morning as an introduction. We're also going to look at the characters and we're going to look at the layout of the book and we're going to pick out some big themes that you want to keep in mind as we move forward in this series in Esther. So this morning, we're just going to do a quick introduction. And by quick, I mean we're not going to really get into uh, verses in the book of Esther. But again, we're going to set up the historical context. We're going to take a look at the characters and, and some major th plot themes uh, that we can keep in our minds as we move forward. So historical setup. We're going to start in the Bible for that, though. Not in the book of Esther, but in the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 1, verse 13 says, And the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, Out of the north the evil will be unleashed on all the inhabitants of the land. For behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, and they will come and place each one of them his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all of its walls around, and against the cities of Judah, and I will pronounce my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness, since they have abandoned me and have offered sacrifices to gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. So in this point in time in the nation of Israel, um, we've seen as we went through the Old Testament survey last year, uh, we saw the cycle of Israel where they fall away from God, they come back to God, they fall away from God, come back to God under different types of governments, and sometimes they have kings, they have judges, they have um, you know, independent little cities and nations, lots of different ways they've organized their culture and their society. But at this point in time, we've got um, basically two parts of Israel happening, and Jerusalem's still a very important city, and God at this time is telling Jeremiah, I've had about enough, and we're going to do some judging. And so that's where the, the beginning of the historical context of Esther uh, starts up is, is basically we're leading up into the Babylonian exile. And we see that in, in Daniel chapter 1. So in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to him, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar and the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king told Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and some of the nobles, youths who were there was no impairment and who were good-looking and suitable for instruction of every kind of experience or expertise, endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge who had the ability to serve the king's court, and he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king allotted for them a daily ration of the king's choice food and wine which he drank and ordered that they be educated for three years, and at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them were the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Hazariah. 
Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. Daniel, he assigned his name, Belshazzar, whoops, screwed that one up, uh, Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and uh, Azariah, Abednego. And so this marks to be, well, a description of the point in time in which Nebuchadnezzar, the dragon of Babylon, comes and besieges uh, Jerusalem. Now, right before he does this, there was uh, a battle up here. So here's Babylon, as you can see, labeled Babylon. Here's Jerusalem over here. Up here in the north, uh, Nebuchadnezzar moved his forces up here. The pharaoh in Egypt at the time came up through Jerusalem, and basically they were, they were coming together because Babylon was starting to take over everywhere. They were wanting to be a great empire. And uh, so Nebuchadnezzar brings his forces up, and uh, the Egyptians, together with some of the armies of the north, basically were going to combine together and try to stop this impending doom of the dragon from Babylon. Jerusalem at the time, the uh, king of Jerusalem, or king in Jerusalem, uh, actually used his army. He actually got killed, I believe, during this battle. Uh, he tried to stop Pharaoh coming up into this place, to uh, into the battle. Egypt and the Pharaoh just marched over him, but he did delay him somewhat, uh, moving up into Karshemish. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar has this battle. They win. And at, after that point, they said, you know what? Let's just go down and besiege Je uh, Jerusalem. We're in the neighborhood. Might as well take it over too. So he comes down. They besiege Jerusalem. And the king at the time says, all right, you know, we don't want any trouble with you. So what we're going to do, we'll pay you your tribute. You go on your way. You let us be, et cetera. After a couple of years, three, four years, uh, the king basically says, well, I don't want to do that anymore. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, I don't think that's such a good idea. And so he goes and besieges it a second time. And at that point, he kills him, the king, and he brings, there's, there's a, a number of different exiles where the people from Jerusalem and Israel get moved into Babylon. But this is another one of those where they take a good set of people and they are exiled. At this point, the people of uh, Israel are scattered, essentially. And so this is the beginning of the, ex one, you know, the exile period of the Jews. And so they are moved around. Um, Jeremiah, at this point, most likely in his 60s, 70s, um, has this to say, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me. This is in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 34. He has crushed me. He has sent me down like an empty vessel. He has swallowed me like a monster. He has filled his stomach with my delicacies, and he has washed me away. Reluctantly, at this point, Jeremiah is taken by his friends, uh, and they flee to Egypt along with some other people. So Jeremiah and a few other people are fleeing to Egypt. Some people are taken back to Babylon. Some, uh, even though Jerusalem is totally destroyed, they knock out the temple. They, they just decimate Jerusalem, the city. Um, some of the other outlying cities are still inhabited by Jews, but at this point, the Jews are pretty much totally scattered across the land. Um, at this point, from here, we go fast forward a little bit. Um, Year-wise, you know, they were in exile, what, 70-ish years, I think. Um, Babylon starts to decay, as most nations do at some point, and another power arises even further east, and there's a lion, a lion from the east rises, and that's Persia, and that's Cyrus the Great is the first one really to consolidate the power from the Persian Empire. Here's a artist rendering of what the uh, Jewish exile looks like as Jerusalem's on fire in the background. Uh, I should note, none of these artworks are mine. I didn't do any of them. Uh, <laughs> if you want the actual sources of them, I will credit the original sources. Um, that's, uh, I, you know, I have them, so if you are interested, I can give them to you. But these are not mine, just for full transparency's sake, as if you thought I actually did these. But uh, Most of the stuff in here is taken from the Bible Project. There's a few that are just online resources that uh, this artwork in particular came from. Uh, some of the other pictures you're going to see in here are directly linked off of Wikipedia sites for the actual battle, etc. So, anyway, disclaimer is done. <clears throat> so, as Cyrus the Great comes, he um, Cyrus the Great rises from Persia, and he basically creates uh, the first real superpower in the world. We've seen great nations. We've seen great 
uh, uh, kingdoms, if you will, but in terms of a global superpower on the face of the earth, the Persian Empire, some consider basically the first real superpower the world has ever seen. And that was started, this particular version of the Persian Empire was started by Cyrus the Great. And he looked over at Babylon and said, I'm going to finish wiping out Babylon. And so he goes, and in a, a pretty cunning military move, he goes on uh, the north side of Babylon, and he doesn't face a lot of resistance there. But to get into the gates of Babylon, everybody thought there's no way they're going to penetrate the walls of Babylon. But there was a sewer system that the, the river came through. Uh, the river was, was coming through grates, and what they did was up north of the city, he had his troops divert the Euphrates River so that the river sank down to you know, knee high and his troops went through the, the river into where the water entered the city and they entered the city that way during a festival where they were preoccupied doing other things. And so the Cyrus the Great came in and basically took over Babylon at that point. And from there, you know, this is his grave, Cyrus the Great's grave as it is um, in Iran at this point, he is revered in Iran. If you read any of the literature, if you've seen anything um, about their history in the, the Persian Empire, Iran, uh, he really influenced the way that the, the Iranian country itself was set up as well as just the culture of the Persian Empire. Um, he was known for a lot of civil rights for people, interestingly enough. The reason the Jews really liked Cyrus is because in the second year of his reign, he made a decree which okayed the freeing of the Jews. And the Jews at that point were free to go back to Jerusalem, and they started then the construction of the temple again. So during his reign, the Jews were released, probably his second-ish year, they were released, and they got to go back to Jerusalem and start rebuilding the temple. And again, this is uh, outside of, I forgot the actual name, uh, the Iranian city that this is in, but this is actually a world uh, heritage uh, site now, protected site for historical reasons. Uh, so that's Cyrus the Great. And as he, he actually fell in battle most likely, as we're told by several sources uh, up north. And so he had a son who basically took over parts of Egypt. He wasn't in power very long. There was a couple more rulers. And then from there, the next ruler of, of note really is uh, Darius the Great. A lot of greats, right? So you got Cyrus the Great, Darius the Great. We're going to see Xerxes the Great in a minute. Um, but Darius is known for basically consolidating the empire. Um, this is the Persian Empire as it stood. Like I said, this is probably the first great superpower the world has ever seen. If you are familiar with your geography, and I'll put a modern-day map over the top of this here in a second, but stemmed all the way from over here, all the way here, modern-day Turkey here, Here's the Holy Land here, Egypt, Libya, uh, down into parts of Saudi Arabia. Didn't quite go down into the, all the desert down here. Uh, modern day Iraq, Iran. Uh, let's go to the next one. You can tell. Yeah. So basically, basically borderlining India is where it stops. So modern day Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Egypt, Libya, southern part or northern part of Saudi Arabia, up into Turkey, and got a foothold into Greece. It's basically the, the empire that he built under Darius. So all this was Persian, the Persian Empire. Uh, Darius was called King of Kings at that point. He was he had a bunch of different titles that he went by, but he's really known for consolidating this entire empire that he passed on to his son. Um, In Egypt, uh, he fought the first war against the Egyptians, in which he failed. Um, he got assassinated, most likely by the king of his, or the the head of his bodyguard. That we're talking about, Darius the Great, got assassinated by the head of his bodyguards. Who, um, yeah, there's, the sources vary historically on on what actually happened there. But his son, or Xerxes, took over. Now, in the first year of Xerxes's reign. He had a few things to contend with. One was, was he the legitimate heir? And he had to deal with some of that stuff. The next thing he had to deal with is some revolt, revolts that started happening in Babylon and Egypt, which he squashed. That took him a year-ish. At that point, though, he went back, and the capital at that point uh, was Susa. And he went back to Susa, 
and had the, the empire had calmed down at that point, somewhat of a peaceful time period, and he said, I'm going to throw a huge party. And we have some historical evidence of that, not just biblically, but uh, other places as well. So at that point, he appears to throw a big party in Susa, saying, I'm so great, the empire is doing well, let's just have a big party. And so that's what he does. After that, um, things in Egypt start flaring up, and he decides to march, Xerxes this is, marches his army from Susa over to Sardis, which is modern-day Turkey, and that's his home base where he's going to launch another attack into Greece. And this is a, a pretty famous battle, the Second Persian War, and uh, I told Heather this week, I said, you know, I, we're doing a, an intro to Esther. I really need to go watch the movie 300. I've never seen it. It's for educational purposes, so we got to watch this movie. Um, for those who don't know or haven't seen the movie 300, it's about the Spartans and the Spartan army who marched up against Xerxes and uh, that battle that happened there. If Xerxes was kind of crazy. Um, like, he was full of himself, we get that, but just to give you an indication, we're told of the story uh, of when they built bridges to, to cross this channel here, uh, part of the water. They built bridges, a, an engineering marvel, really, and they broke down, and so he was so upset with the water and the ocean for destroying these bridges, he had his military commanders go and take whips and lash the ocean uh, 300 times. <laughs> So because they did not, the ocean was not obeying him, you know, king of all kings, he had shackles uh, that he had them throw into the ocean to, to trap the ocean. This guy was uh, a character for sure. And the movie 300 makes him a l possibly a little more bizarre than really he was, but, but he definitely had, uh, I guess to, to be at any point in position of power like that, you got to be a little bit crazy, I guess. But, um, but he marches his army up here. And they, the Greeks try to figure out what they're going to do. They see this impending army. They send, uh, they send a, a regiment, essentially, up north because they think they're going to get attacked up there. And they also send their ships down south for a sea battle. And so what Xerxes does is he sends emissaries out or, or people out saying, hey, you guys want to submit to me and we'll be cool. If so, just give me a sample of your water and food, basically meaning the resources of life you're now surrendering to the empire of Persia. And if you don't, we're going to come and destroy you. And those are your options. So up here in Thrace, up here, these guys just say, yeah, we're not going to mess with you. You've got this huge army. We're not doing that. He comes down to Athens, and the Athenians basically slit their throats and dump them down a well. Um, nothing sends a message like shooting the messenger. And so when Xerxes gets word of that, you know, he says, well, we're invading. You know, we're going all the way down. Uh, the Spartans are down here in the southern part of Greece. And you may have heard of the Spartans, the Spartan army. They were the, one of the most powerful fighting forces on the face of the earth. If they had, you know, a few hundred thousand more of them, you know, they probably could have pushed back and taken over this. But in the story of the 300, the movie 300, there are 300 of them uh, going up against Xerxes' army, which Herodotus, the Greek historian, puts at one million. Uh, probably it was less than that. We're probably talking in the 200,000 range. But still, 200,000 versus 300 at the time, you know, not too good of odds. Um, really, they had an army of 7,000. The movie leaves this part out. They took 7,000 up there, and they up to the north, and 300 of them remain as they send the rest of the army back down south when they realize this is not going to go well. But you've got 300 Spartans that take on, and they actually hold off the army of Xerxes for three-day-ish time period, about a week in total as they fight them off, and the rest of the army escapes back south for another major battle that happens down south. Now, the way they did this is, numbers-wise, not looking good, right? You got 250, up to 500,000 maybe, army coming against 7,000. Not good odds. So what they decide to do is there's a city up in Greece uh, where they have a mountains on one side and the seas on the other side, and it comes to a, a narrow channel. And basically, they funnel them into this so that only a certain number of army from Xerxes can get through at any given time. So what's they, that's what they do. And here is a shot of what that looks like. This is uh, Theomopolite, basically the hot gates. Uh, this area is known for its hot springs. That's how it gets its name. 
And what you can't see over, if you were to pan the screen this way to the right, this is the ocean, the Mediterranean Ocean over here. Here's your mountains on this side. This road right here most likely is where the shoreline was at the time, a lot of historians say. Uh, during the, it's been eroded and, and the, the sea has been pushed back you know, a little bit. But they, were, they say that most likely the, the highway here is where the sea level was. So basically they were funneling them down into this place. Now, you know, obviously a, a no, good number of people can fit through there, but not your whole 250,000. So they funneled them down into this little area, and that's where they made their stand. And that's where King uh, Dionysus, the, the legendary, you know, Spartan king, fights them off, holds them off with his 300 Spartans, at least to the point where they can, uh, the rest of the army can escape back down south, which is what they do. The movie was, uh, if you like blood and gore, it has plenty of that. It wasn't you know, a particularly great movie, but like I said, I had to watch it for uh, educational purposes for the sermon, so that's what we did. Um, <laughs> a few more years until you can watch that one. <laughs> All right, so what happens after that? Um, after Xerxes takes this battle, he actually uh, wins this battle, and they move south um, Another great sea battle happens down south where the Greeks lure the big, bulky Persian ships into a bay, and they don't do well in there, and the little Greek ships come and basically just destroy them. Uh, sources say that Xerxes is actually sitting up on a hillside watching that battle happen, and when he sees his naval fleet get destroyed, he basically says, uh, I'm going to go back to Susa, and uh, leaves a couple of generals there to hopefully finish mopping up what happens. And so he takes off. He basically figures that if something happens, he's going to be cut off. If you look at the map here, if he's got his army marched across this strait here and his whole army's over here, if something happens, he's going to be cut off from the mainland from the rest of his kingdom. He decides to take most of his army back across into Turkey, back down in this area here, and leaves a force there to try to finish off the Greeks. Well, that doesn't happen. The Greeks actually win the Second Persian War. Uh, there's a follow-up battle that happens at the very end of actually the movie 300 that you see. And at the very end of, of uh, that, it basically represents what happens. And the Greeks defeat the Persian Empire. And I don't, I don't want to say they sulk off, but they retreat back into the mainland of, of the Persian Empire. So the Greeks come out victorious in the Second Persian War, just like it would happen in the First Persian War, which Xerxes' father, Darius, tried to do. And he lost the First Persian battle. His son tried to take up that you know, momentum going into Greece, lost the second battle, and at that point, that's where we're at, kind of a standstill, and so this is the Persian army at its height. All right, a lot of history, a lot of stuff happening. Why did we go through all that? Well, at the time of the book of Esther, during this exile period, a family goes in it, from exile from the city of Jerusalem, goes to Babylon, and as all these events we've talked about are unfolding, they take their family... And as the, Babylonian, or as the Babylonian Empire fades away, and as the Persian Empire comes into greatness, and the great capital of Susa comes into establishment, they pack up their family, and they go from Babylon, most likely, and head to this, this you know, sparkling, big light city of Susa. And so a small Jewish community, most likely of about 100, packs up and they head for the greatest and richest city at that time the world had ever known in Susa. And among these people uh, is a baby named, most likely named Esther. We're not exactly sure where along this journey she was born. We know at some point her parents died and she was left to the care of her cousin Mordecai slash uncle. He, Age-wise, he was probably more like an uncle figure, but he was in charge of raising her. And as they moved into Susa, that's where the story begins, and this is the historical context of what's happening as we look at the intro to Esther, is that we've got these great forces that have been fighting, and we've got uh, the uh, Babylonian decline, we've got the Persian ascension, and with the great Persian empire, this family finds themselves in the capital of the Persian city of Susa. And so that leads us into the introduction of the characters for the story, Esther being the first one. So Esther is the heroine of the story. We're not told much, again, about where actually she grew up, other than somehow she ended up with her cousin Mordecai in the city of Susa. There are some indications of 
you know, of how they got there uh, that we'll get into as we go, you know, chapter by chapter through Esther. But she's the heroine of the story. She basically gets to the point where uh, she wins a beauty contest to become the new queen. And in that position of power, she gets the opportunity to save the Jewish people in the Persian area, Persian Empire. So that's the big point picture story of Esther, the character Esther in the book of Esther. And we will see that moving forward as we go. The second character is Mordecai, who is from the line of Benjamin. And we're told that uh, they go in exile period to Babylon, from Babylon, somehow end up in Susa. He is, like I said, kind of a father figure to Esther. He's a cousin slash uncle, depending on how you see the, the genealogy and how you see a couple different things, but some kind of close relative to Esther who's in charge of raising her. Uh, I read it, I think, as cousin. Like I said, though, he's probably older, so in terms of like family relationships, more of an uncle. Uh, but he raises her, gives her sound wisdom at points during the book. And uh, the next character we've got is King Ahasuerus or Ahasuerus. Now, with a lot of these names, like I said before, if you just say them confidently, nobody will question your pronunciation of it. Um, so why, again, did we go through that? Well, this King Ahasuerus, or Ahasuerus in the book, um, as you look at how the events unfold, has a strong correlation, and many biblical scholars link him to Xerxes. He is possibly Xerxes the I. There's other indications of who he was. He could have been his father Darius, possibly Xerxes' his son Artaxerxes. Um, but there are a lot of people, and there's some you know, decent arguments to be made that this king in the book of Esther is representative of Xerxes the Great. And so, you know, you ask, why is that important? As you walk through the book of Esther and the timeline of it, in the first chapter, we see him dispose of his queen. And a couple of years later is when Esther comes into power. Well, what happened in that time frame? Well, that big party, like I said, is happening. That big party's happening. And at that point, he disposes of his queen and there's a couple-year gap. Well, that couple-year gap, if it is indeed Xerxes I, is him taking his army up into Egypt and fighting the Second Persian War. And so as he's coming back down into the capital, this is the king that we see in Esther, if this is who indeed it's representative of, that the, this king is you know, coming back from this defeat of the Greeks, uh, by the Greeks, bringing his army back into Susa. And the character portrayed in the book of Esther is really... Um, he's, he's kind of a drunken fool type character. Now, I don't know whether this is Xerxes, if it is Xerxes, if it's him coming back and saying, I just got beat by the Egyptians. I don't want to I just want a vacation. I don't want to have anything to do with, you know, politics, et cetera. Right now, we're just going to, you know, just kind of go along and have a party. Uh, we don't know. We don't know why, you know, uh, the, the author of, of Esther portrays him this way. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the kind of the King Ahasuerus character in this book is, the king and possibly, you know, possibly Xerxes. Again, there's a, there's a few other guesses as to who this represents, but uh, whoever goes through the book of Esther after me will have to uh, figure that one out. Uh, the next character that we really want to talk about is Haman, and Haman is the cunning villain of the story. He's uh, in a high court official, and he comes up with the plan to wipe out the Jews, essentially. He goes around and says, I'm really great, and... He wants Mordecai to bow down to him. Mordecai says, I'm not bowing down to you. And at that point, he finds out he's a Jew. And so Haman says, I'm going to wipe out all the Jews. And so he rolls a die or a purr uh, in Hebrew uh, to figure out the date that they're going to destroy the Jews. And that's keep that in mind for later. So he rolls a die to figure out when he's going to destroy them. And then as, you, as the story unfolds, we see Esther come along and provide a, a salvation for that. The last uh, main character is Vashti, who is the queen, the first queen of King Ahasuerus. And she, modern-day feminists love her because she stood up to this great king by telling him, I'm not going to come dance at your party. So what happens, and we'll get into it in a little more detail as we go through the book, but at the very beginning of the book, um, the king is having a big banquet. He wants his queen to come and show off her beauty for all his guests. She's holding her own banquet at the time, and she basically says, no, I'm having my own banquet. I'm not going to come be your beauty queen and, and show off. And so the king gets really upset about that, 
and says basically you're defying the king, you can't do that, and he strips her of her status as queen. And so that's Queen Vashti. <gasps> All right, those are the main characters. All right, so why is Esther important in the book of Esther? So here's some, some key themes I think we want to keep in mind as we're going through. Um, this is a, the picture of the mausoleum, I guess it would be technically, mausoleum of Esther and Mordecai. This is actually in Iran as well. The, the Jews that are in Iran uh, see themselves as descendants of Esther and Mordecai in that family, so that's actually a site. Here's a, a shot of the inside of that. Those presumably are the, you know, coffins. I don't think the actual remains of Esther and Mordecai are in them, but this is the mausoleum that is set up for uh, basically the remembered site of Mordecai and Esther in Iran. A lot of these places you see, you know, Iranian history. You see a, a strong Jewish contingent there as well. Like I said, the hundred Jews that went into the area, uh, the records, extra, extra biblical records that we have, uh, do indicate that the Jews rose to prominence in both, uh, you know, places of in the government and consulting, you know, the king. We also see them being pretty prosperous in terms of their business adventures. So we have that. All right, here is the structure of the book of Esther really fast. Uh, it's like I said in the intro, it's really a beautifully laid out book. Um, it, I like this view of it because it really shows the uh, contrast that the author is making. And the author of Esther, we really don't know who it is. It could be Mordecai. It could be somebody else. We're not exactly sure. But he, he, I think he takes a, a, a page out of the, the Joseph story because the Joseph story really parallels the, the book of Esther. If you remember, Joseph gets sent into Egypt. Both are about a, a poor Jewish person, gets sent off to a foreign power, gets elevated to a position of authority and to the highest places of the government. And in that position, both are able to save their families and save the Jewish people. So he really, I think, is the author of Esther, looks in, and uses that as a kind of a template guide as he's writing this story, because there are a lot of parallels. But in the first section, you have the king of the Persian uplifted as greatness, and on the, at the back side of it, as the parallel, you have Mordecai's greatness as he saves, uh, well, him and Esther save the Jews. You have Haman's exaltation here. Over here, you have Mordecai's exaltation or elevation. You have the... Um, decree to kill the Jews here. Here you have Esther and Mordecai's decree to save the Jews, and we'll get more into that. Here you have, <clears throat> down here, you have the banquets of uh, uh, the king and Esther and Mordecai's plan to, to uh, undo that decree. Over here you have Esther's banquets where she actually does that. In the very middle of the story, the pivot point of the story is Haman's uh, being put beneath Mordecai and Mordecai raised, Mordecai raised up above him. So in each of these sections, you have a parallel on the other side, very, very well thought out and constructed story. What in the world? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one of the direct reasons for the book of Esther um, and that we get from the book of Esther is the Jewish holiday of Purim or Purim. The, again, remember the die that was cast, per, is per in Hebrew. And so what we get is the Jewish celebration of Purim out of this book. And we see that some scholars say that, that this celebration happened before the book of Esther, and they just used the book of Esther as an excuse to justify their celebration. Um, it doesn't seem that way. And if you look at the Jewish holidays historically, they're always based off some work of God that's happening, you know, all through the down through the Jewish holiday system. There's very few where it's just some holiday for no reason, and then they make up a story later to go on top of it. Um, so historically, it doesn't seem that way. It does, at least from my from the research I've done, it does seem that Purim or Purim came out of these events. Whether I'll leave the people, yeah, Shane and, and my father can delve into that and how historical each of the events were. Blah blah blah. Any case. The book of Esther sets up, I think, the, the celebration of Purim for the Jews. And this is a picture of it in Jerusalem, of what a celebration looks like for during Purim. Um, there are a few main things that happen during that celebration. One, the book of Esther is read in the synagogue traditionally the night before and then again the morning after. So you listen to the, the entire reading of Esther two times during the celebration. Um, they have giving of food baskets, essentially, to your friends and, and family. Uh, you give to the poor. 
And the fourth, what is the fourth one? I forgot now, I'll have to look it up. Um, oh, eating a festive meal. Of course, it's a Jewish holiday. You have to eat a meal. <clears throat> Your hunger will make you something, right? So there are some things that have been added on top of it, kind of like it, uh, it's a combination, really, if you, if you look at our holidays, it's a combination of like Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas and Halloween in the sense of what they do during it. So they dress up in costumes and stuff. Like I said, they do give gifts to people. They do have readings of the Book of Esther during it. And this is a parade, like I said, in the city of Jerusalem. So that's one thing, a, a direct, you know, context of, of the Book of Esther. There's more things we can pull out of the Book of Esther, I think. And one of those is despite God never being mentioned directly in the Book of Esther, and that's one of the, you know, whenever you hear the Book of Esther being studied, that's one of the things that always comes up is, oh, the God is never mentioned in the book. Uh, and that's true, but you see His hand everywhere in this book if you look for it. And that is one of the things that I think we need to pull out of this is, is looking for those moments in our lives where even though we don't think God is at work or even though we can't see Him directly working, to find those moments in our lives that God is working and how we can be involved in them. Going back to this one, yeah. Uh, as we're going to see throughout this story, there's, there's so many moments of coincidences that happen throughout this story. And I've had times in my life where, you know, people will say, this happened to you. Oh, that's just a coincidence. But if I'm really paying attention, I'm really looking at what is happening, I go, I can't explain that any other way than that's God's hand working in my life, working in my situation during that point in time. And you see so many of these moments happen in the book of Esther that you, you can't escape, really, if you think about it and for any amount of time, that God is at work through this entire story and placing people where he wants them to be to save his people. Um, third thing we keep out of this is, or can take out of this as we look through the book of Esther, is God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. He promised the Jews that he would save them. He promised the Jews they could go back to Jerusalem at some point. He promised the Jews many, many things, and you see him fulfilling promises through this. And so as we look in our own lives and as we walk through, and even if we don't see God directly, we can always fall back that he will keep his promises. All right, wrapping up. If I were to pick uh, a verse, like a key verse or a key theme for the book of Esther, it would probably be out of Esther chapter 4, and we'll wrap up with this. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back his answer, and this is when they're talking about what they're going to do about this decree to go kill all the Jews. He says, Do not think that because you are in the king's house you are alone, and all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance from the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So Mordecai tells her, maybe it is, maybe, just maybe, that you've been placed in this position in this time in order to save somebody, in order to have an influence over your people. And how can we take that in our lives? It's Hopefully it's pretty obvious, right? There's many places in time where God may have placed us in a particular place, in a particular situation. We need to trust Him, use His guiding, and it's, who knows, somebody may be saved, whether it's coming to Christ, maybe it's a more direct thing, you know, from, uh, s different situations in their life, making a bad decision, whatever the case may be, I don't know. But there are moments in time when God places us in a particular point in time that we should trust Him and rely on what He has for us. The ups and downs of evil are seen in this book, too, and that goes along with his promises. As you see this curve happening, you see this evil, evil, evil happening, then you see a flip and coming back up to uh, ultimately the Jews being saved. So even though we see the ups and downs of evil, ultimately we can rely on God and his triumph over evil. Let's pray. God, we thanks for this time and this quick introduction to the book of Esther, and I pray as we... Uh, go through it in more detail, God, that you would really help us see you at work in this book, um, that you would help us in the understanding of the context and the understanding of why events happen and uh, just ultimately seeing your hand in all aspects of life, not just in the church when we're reading the Bible or, or things that are obvious, God, but 
even if it's not in church, just like it wasn't in Jerusalem, you're at work in every place in the world, God. Uh, regardless of whether there's a church there or not, you're still at work preparing places and people to go. And uh, we just thank you for that, that you care about me personally and us in this room and, and uh, just every person that's alive on the earth. And you have a hand and, and are working and observant to all things happening on in your creation. We thank you for that. Uh, God, I just hope our, our time in Esther would be beneficial for us, that we would help, help you would help us to see you better through that. In Jesus' name, amen.